Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk a little bit about mechanics. Mechanics of what, how to tell a story about a company, how to convert that story into numbers, and how to enter that number into one of the spreadsheets that I use, kind of a generic spreadsheet, a spreadsheet I use for pretty much every company that is on my website called FCFF Simple Ginzu. Now, a little bit of history. The, the reason I use the word Ginzu is uh, one of the TV commercials I remember 30, 35 years ago was this commercial where there was this Japanese chef selling Ginzu knives. And essentially, the end product of this commercial, after about 25 minutes, was you bought a whole stack, 100 knives, by the time you were done. A knife for cutting, a knife for chopping, a knife for slicing, a knife for everything. This spreadsheet is my attempt to kind of bring everything in valuation into one spreadsheet. I might have achieved it, I might not have achieved it, but it can be a little overwhelming if A, you're not that familiar with Excel, B, you're not that familiar with valuation, and C, you're not familiar with the company. And usually it's a trifecta. So what I thought I'd do is use a company to illustrate how you can use a spreadsheet to value a company. So let me set up the process. One of the points I have made repeatedly over time is that to value a company, you need to start with a story, that a good valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers, that every number in evaluation should reflect a story, and every story should be connected to a number. So what I'd like to do is actually use a company to illustrate the process, and the company I'm going to use is a company called Severstal. It's a Russian steel company, a company I knew very little about until a few months ago. So you can't accuse me of having accumulated knowledge of the, about the company, but a company I decided I wanted to value. So in order to value a company, the first place you start, of course, is with the numbers, especially because it's a publicly traded company. Now, Severstal is a Russian company, but it's actually incorporated and traded in the London Stock Exchange as well. But basically, I'm going to focus on its Russian roots. If you look at the history of Severstal, you see a very interesting story. In the early part, 1997 through 2003, you see the company as a Russian company, not growing that fast with pretty hefty margins. Now, Severstal, incidentally, is a steel company that op also happens to own the iron ore mines that feed into its steel companies. A lot of steel companies don't do that. So 1997 through 2003, a low ambition period kind of settling in, kind of laying a foundation. Between 2004 and 2011, Severstal became a global company. Global in what sense? Its revenue growth kicked up and it went into other parts of the world. And you can see the revenues take off from about 2 billion to close to 16 billion by the time you get to 2008. The crisis hits, revenues drop, and for a while, right after, in 2010 and 2011, it looked like Severstal was going to go back to the way it was. Now, during this period between 2003 and 2011, it's also worth noting that steel prices, iron ore prices stayed high. And much as I hate to do this, the reason was China. China, with its big infrastructure spending, was keeping the prices high. So 2011, in a sense, was the high water mark for prices. Since 2011, you can see that the company's revenues have shrunk. Its operating income has dropped as well, but not by as much. Its margins have actually held up pretty well. But the revenues in 2016 were about a third of the revenues in 2011. So looking at this picture, you can see, first, a kind of low ambition company in the first part of the picture, then this high growth global company in the middle, then a reversal back to being a Russian company with high margins at the end. Now, these numbers are also played out when you look at how much Severstal has put into its invested capital, you know, into, its, uh, into its plant, its equipment, its mines over time. Again, initially, you don't see much growth in the early establishment period, 1997 through 2003. Then you see the explosive growth between 2004 and 2011. And then you see the decline in invested capital. But return in invested capital, again, has held up remarkably well. Now, you're saying, what does this tell me? Well, it looks like Severstal is a shrinking company. Its revenues are dropping with fairly substantial margins. Now, the key thing to, to, to think about is, is this an unusual feature of the steel? Uh, is this an unusual company or is this a par, par for the course in the steel business? So here's what I did. I compared Severstal to the rest of the steel companies, both in emerging markets and globally. And here's what the numbers look like. If you look at growth, it looks like negative revenue growth is more the rule than the exception. The historical growth in revenues has been negative across the board. Though Severstal's revenue growth has been more negative than the rest of the of the sector. You're saying that's bad news? Well, no. 
it's uh, hold on for a moment because they're shrinking faster, but perhaps they have the right strategy. Because if you look at their profit margins, both in terms of return, uh, uh, their profitability, both in terms of return on capital, which is what you make on your invested capital, and your pre-tax operating margin, sever style, sticks out like a sore thumb in a good way. Its returns on capital and operating margins are huge relative to the rest of the sector. Now, when I saw this for the first time, I was curious, what's going on? And it looks like in their Russian operation, Severstal has significant competitive advantages, barriers to entry. Now, you can fill in the blanks as to how much of these barriers of entry come from political barriers to entry, economic barriers to entry. Some of this is just the fact that they that's, that's where they've grown. But they are clearly much more profitable than the typical steel company. They pay less in taxes. They have, le they have less debt than the typical steel company. And they are giving back more cash, uh, you know, holding back more cash than the typical steel company. So we're getting a picture of Severstall, of a company that was ambitious but seems to have scaled its ambitions back. But it's always been focused on profits, a company that has not gone heavily into debt. So I think I'm ready to tell a story about Severstall. And here's what my story is going to be. I'm going to call it the realistic steel company. What do I mean by this? It looks to me like the steel business has become a bad business, especially in the last five years. It, I don't know whether it was ever a great business, but it's become a bad business. Now, if you open up any corporate finance textbook, here's the manual for what you should do if you're a company in a bad business. You should get smaller. That's what Severstall has done. You should go back to that, that portion of your business that's the most profitable. That's Russia for Severstall. That's what they've done. So in my story, I will assume that Severstall is going to put its growth ambitions on the back burner and focus on profitability, which means that when, in my story, Severstall would return to growth now that they've shrunk to a third of the size they used to be, but not high growth because high growth here comes with lower profits. They're going to settle for low growth, maybe 2%, maybe 3%, but they will keep those high margins that they get because they're in the Russian market. I'm a realist. Even those in the Russian market, there's potentially going to be competition and the margins are probably going to shrink from the 2016 levels. But I see it as a low growth, profitable business that is not going to hit the debt lever very strongly. That is the story that's going to animate my valuation of Severstock. You ready? We haven't talked about a single number. Now that I have a story, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the Excel spreadsheet, which has which is the FCFF Ginzu. I've entered the numbers already, but I'm going to take you item by item through the spreadsheet so you can see how the numbers play out. So let me start at the very top. Right? So this is on this is the worksheet. If you look at the at the bottom of the of the spreadsheet, you see all the worksheets. Go to the input sheet. That's the number in which the bulk of your input numbers are going to come in. The first input should be pretty obvious. It asks you for the date, enter whatever month, or if you want the specific date that you did the valuation in. The second, of course, is the name of the company. Then come the key inputs. So first, the question I ask you is the country of incorporation. Now, this is not a big deal. But if you, if you can sometimes have Russian companies incorporated in the UK. I actually prefer to go back to the true country in which these are, the, country's op the company's operations are. So if your operations happen to be in Germany and you incorporate in Ireland, I'm going to treat you like a German company. Because I'm going to use this country as a shortcut to come up with an equity risk premium, but you can override this if you're in multiple countries. So don't worry too much about it. Enter your country of incorporation. It's a pull-down menu, so when you pull it down, you'll actually see a choice of countries. Most, most countries should be in there. I have 145 countries. The next question I ask you is what industry you're in. Again, it's a pull-down menu, and I put them in the steel business. You're saying, what if I'm in two businesses? Don't worry. We'll revisit this and allow you to fix it. And again, I give you, I ask you the same question on a global level. You can see, in a minute, you're going to see why I ask you both. Then I ask you for revenues for the most recent year. When I say this year, when you're doing valuation, you want the most updated numbers you can. Well, if you're doing evaluation in March or April, those updated numbers, if you have a calendar year, might be the most recent 10K. If you're doing evaluation in July or, or August, your most recent 12 months might be the last, last six months of the previous fiscal year and the first six months of this year. I, so to me, what I'm looking for here is the most updated revenues you can over the... Tra so I use trading 12-month data. Then I ask you what you got in the last 10K. Okay. So basically, if um, if this were um, July of 2016, my most recent 
12 months might have been from from Ju Ju from July of 2015 through June of 2016 my last 10 K might be the calendar year 2015 so if you if you're lucky enough to be working with 10k numbers then you'll have two 10k numbers the most recent 10k and the previous 10k then just to give me a sense of when I when I compute growth rates how much time has elapsed since the last 10k I ask you how many years since so in the in the in the convenient case again where you have the most recent 10k for this year and the previous year's 10k you can enter one but if you have the other scenario where you know half of the previous year and half of this year your trailing 12 months includes half of a new year, then enter 0.5, because then I can scale the growth. So that's the first input. What were your, what were your revenues? And this is your total revenues, last year and this year. Then I ask you for operating income. Scale right down the income statement, and you should see an operating income line item. I use the word earnings before interest and tax and operating income interchangeably. So again, enter that number from last year, from the most recent year, and from the previous 10K. And again, give me the time period that's elapsed. Then I ask you for interest expenses. Enter the gross interest expenses. Some companies net out interest income against interest expenses. Go to the footnotes and find the interest expense. You want the total interest expense. It, no, so don't put a sign in front of it. I know that interest expenses are an outflow. So put in the interest expense for this year and again for the most recent 10K. Then I ask you for book value of equity. This is the total shareholders' equity. It includes retained earnings, paid in capital, all that stuff. It's a cumulative shareholders' equity. It can be a negative number. Don't freak out. It's okay if it's a negative number. But enter that number for the most recent from the most recent balance sheet and the balance sheet from the most recent 10K. And then enter the book value of debt. I want total debt, all interest bearing debt. Don't include things like accounts payable, supplier credit, which are non-interest bearing. So usually it'll be long-term debt, long-term portion, um, short-term portion of long-term debt, short-term debt, capital leases, anything that shows up on the balance sheet that's interest bearing. Again, accumulate all of that number and put it in for the most recent from the most recent balance sheet in the previous year. You think what if I have leases? Hang on just a moment, because I'm going to give you a chance if you have leases to say yes to the question of do you have operating lease commitments? And if you do. There's a worksheet at the bottom that you can see where you can go in and enter your lease. So make sure if you say yes to this and you pull down and say yes, that in fact you go in and enter your company's lease commitments. Very quickly, let me pull up what that's going to look like. If you have lease commitments, I will ask you for the most recent year's expense. Don't leave that blank. And then go to lease commitments for the next five years and beyond. All of those numbers should be in the footnotes for your company if it has lease commitments. So basically, that is the way you bring leases in. So don't end up double counting leases. What I mean by that is if you capitalize operating leases on your own and put into total debt and you've already done it, just leave this as no. Because if you say yes here, I will double count your lease commitment. So this is a way in which you can bring lease commitments into your debt if you haven't done it already. Then ask for cash and marketable securities. So basically, this is that that cumulative item that basically is is cash and mar uh, you will see it right at the top of the balance sheet, usually at the start of the asset section. So from the most recent and the year before. Now comes a question that a lot of people have trouble with. I ask you for other non-operating assets and cross holdings. Please don't throw in everything but the kitchen sink in here. This is not meant for items like goodwill and intangibles and all the other stuff that accountants are brought in. This is primarily for holdings in other companies. Holdings like what? Like Yahoo's holdings in Yahoo Japan and Alibaba, which are minority holdings. We own 3, 5, 10, 15% of a company. You want to put in the value of those holdings, for again, from the most recent balance sheet in the year before. It would be nice if you had market values for these holdings, but that's tough to get usually, so enter the book value if you can't find it. Many of your companies, this will be zero. So don't go looking for trouble by saying, I can't find this, let me enter something. Check to see if your company has holdings. Then also check on the liability side of your balance sheet if your company has a non-controlling or a minority interest. Saying what does that reflect? It reflects the fact that your company has a subsidiary that is it is fully consolidated, but it does not own a hundred percent. So the minority interest reflects the portion of the subsidiary that does not belong to you. Again, it would be nice if you had market values for those, but if you don't, just enter the book values. So you can see what the numbers look like for uh, for um, for Severstall. And in fact, based on those numbers, if you go to the right of the spreadsheet, you'll actually see me compute a comparison of your company. In the case of Severstall, you see the, the revenues drop by 7.5%. 
And this is why I asked you for what industry you're in. I actually pull up what the averages look like for both U.S. and global companies, for steel companies. So you can see what your revenue growth looks like, what your margin looks like, what your sales to capital ratio looks like. The sales to capital is actually sales divided by invested capital. It's a measure of how much revenue you get for every dollar of invested capital and the return on in invested capital. And you can already see the reinforcement for the story. Severstall is actually shrinking faster than the typical steel company, but it's vastly more profitable than the typical steel company. And that is at the core of our story. Then as for number of shares outstanding, right? usually what I do is I go into Yahoo Finance or Google Finance and I look at the actual number of shares outstanding. Not fully diluted. You don't want to add in options because I'm going to give you a chance to bring in options later. This is the actual number of shares outstanding. So put the number of shares in and the current stock price, current as in right now, because you're doing the valuation as of right now, and then I ask you for an effective tax rate. Now, usually for most companies, this is provided in the financials. It's one of the numbers you can look up. If you cannot find it, go to the income statement, and here's how you compute the effective tax rate. Take the taxes paid divided by taxable income in the income statement. So accrual taxes divided by accrual income, and what you get will be the effective tax rate. Just a point of clarity, if you have a money losing company, you probably are not paying taxes, your effective tax rate is zero. Rather than enter zero, just enter your marginal tax rate. So if you have a money losing company, enter the marginal tax rate. Don't worry, I'll take care of the fact that you're money losing. So enter the effective tax rate. Then I ask you for your marginal tax rate. The marginal tax rate is the tax rate on your last dollar of income. You use this to compute what your tax savings and interest are going to be. If you have no idea, and because it comes from the tax code, it depends on where you're incorporated and report most of your income. You say, how do I know what the marginal tax rate is in Ireland? Rest easy. If you go to one of the worksheets towards the end where it gives you global data, glo you know, country equity, see the country equity risk premium worksheet at the bottom that I'm pointing to? If you go in there, you'll actually see tax rate by country, and you can pull up the tax rate for your country and enter that marginal tax rate. For U.S. companies, the marginal tax rate right now is 40%. But given that there's a lot of talk, it might end up being just talk, about changing the tax code and lowering the corporate tax rate, I would use a lower tax rate. Not the 15% that you see being thrown around. I don't think we're going to go that low. But perhaps 25 to 30%. That's pretty much the input stage. Now comes the interesting part, where you convert your story into numbers. Remember the story I told you about Severstall? It's a company that has shrunk, but it's what I call a realistic steel company. It's shrunk back to its Russian roots, which are its most profitable business. I think now that it's shrunk by two-thirds, it's going to go back to growth, but low growth. It's not going to be the ambitious, fast-growing steel company it was about 10 years ago. It's going to go back to about 3% revenue growth. That's not much, essentially, you're growing at the inflation rate plus a little real growth. I'm going to assume that the margins right now, which are 25.81%, which are out of sight for the sector, are going to stay high, but they're not going to stay at 25.81%. You're saying, where did the 19.13% come from? That was actually the average operating margin that Severstall had during the glory days, but in 2000. So it's actually, I'm assuming they're going to revert back to a margin that they had historically, an average margin rather than stay at the sky high number that they had in 2016. For the sales to capital ratio, again, I'm just going to assume that they're going to revert back to the average they had over that period. Now you can see how I go back and forth between current numbers and historical numbers and forecasted numbers. I have no shame about doing this because my job in evaluation is to put my views into the valuation. And you can see a mix of my estimates like revenue growth, historical numbers like the margin, the sales to capital ratio, perhaps even industry averages for some companies. You have the judgment. It's your judgment call to make. It's your valuation. And those numbers play out. Incidentally, for those of you who are familiar with the other way to value companies, which is uh, you know, which is a more rigid approach, where your margins are, are stable, and your um, you know return on capital stays fixed, you can actually compute the growth rate as the return on capital times reinvestment rate. You can use the spreadsheet to accomplish the same end game if you leave the margins at today's levels and the sales to capital ratio at today's levels then your return on capital will stay constant your growth rate will become your reinvestment rate times return on capital so that's just a tangent let's move on to your discount rate numbers I ask you for a risk-free rate that risk-free rate should depend on the currency in which you're doing the valuation 
They're saying, how come it's so low for a Russian company? Remember, Severus Dollar is a steel company. It actually reports all of its financials in U.S. dollars. Why would I want to value it in rubles? So I've used a U.S. dollar risk free rate. Now, the cost of capital, it says initial cost of capital. That's what I'm going to start your company at. You, If you already have a number for your company that you worked out, you can enter it there. If you don't, go to the worksheet that says cost of capital worksheet, and I'll take you through the process of estimating cost of capital. By doing what? I let you estimate a bottom-up beta by entering the businesses you're in. So this is where you can say, well, you know what? Severstal is both a steel company and a mining company, and I'll compute the beta. That's what I did. Then I let you compute the equity risk premium based on the parts of the world you operate in. And as you can see for Severstal, I've broken them, the, broken them down regionally. And while Russia is, is the biggest chunk of the revenues, they get revenues from outside Russia as well. I let you compute an equity risk premium. I bring in the debt. I, so basically, I let you enter a cost of debt. So you, this is the, the worksheet you can use to compute your cost of capital if you don't have it. But if you have it already, just enter that number. Then I mop up some loose ends. If you have options outstanding, you want to enter yes here. I'll ask you for the number of options, the average strike price, and the average maturity. You're saying, how would I find that? If your company has options outstanding, this should be in the footnotes. Uh, but again, a lot of companies don't have options outstanding. Don't go looking for trouble. If your company has no options, just leave it at nothing. And you usually have to enter a standard deviation on the stock price. And if you don't know what standard deviation is, if you go to the industry averages, and I have both the U.S. and the global numbers here, you'll see a, actually a column where I have the standard deviation for stock prices by sector. You can just pull up that number and use it. That's it. That's the bulk of the inputs for the valuation. The rest is all tweaking and finessing. And my suggestion here is these are default assumptions. If you have no idea what you're doing, just go into no, 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 no for all of them. Just leave everything at the default. If you feel comfortable overriding my numbers, here's what you should do. If you say, do you want to override the assumption? You enter yes. So in this case, I say, I assume your cost of capital is similar to that of typical mature companies, which is the risk-free rate plus 4.5%, which for in the case of the U.S. dollar, with the risk-free rate of 2.5% would give me a 7% cost of capital. I think that's a little too low for Severstall, so I enter a cost of capital of 8.5%. Now, if you're a company in a business which is very competitive, your return on capital is going to converge on your cost of capital, and many people in terminal value, when you get to stable growth, assume that. That's a default assumption, but again, there are some companies with the competitive advantages are so strong, you might assume they can earn more than their cost of capital. I haven't done that for Severstall, but if I were valuing Apple or Microsoft or Google, I might say yes here, in which case I can enter a return on capital higher than the cost of capital. In fact, if you have a value destructive company run by incompetent management that takes projects that earn less than the cost of, cost of capital, you can use this to kind of enter that input as well. Then I ask you, is your company likely to fail? You say, what are you talking about? A DCF valuation is a going concern value. I am assuming your company will survive, and not just for the next five years, but forever. And so when you do a DCF, you're implicitly assuming your company will make it and survive. But what if it will not? What if you have a young startup or a distressed company? If you feel there's a chance your company will not make it, then you can say yes to this, this question. Enter the likelihood that it will fail, and if it does fail, tell me what you will make as your liquidation proceeds. And I let you specify that either as a percentage of your book value or your estimated value, and you can even enter zero, saying, if I fail, the business is worth nothing. Then I ask you, do you, you know, do you want me to assume your tax rate will move towards your marginal tax rate? Remember, you entered an effective tax rate and a marginal tax rate. I, I will, the default is I will move it towards a marginal tax rate. If you say yes, you know, if you, if you want to override this, then basically I will leave your effective tax rate much lower than the marginal tax rate. Perhaps your company has found a magic way to pay less than its marginal tax rate. Then I ask you, do you have losses carried forward? If you have NOLs coming in from previous years, I need to know because those NOLs can save you taxes. And so if you say yes, you also should look up how much of an NOL you're carrying forward. Finally, in this valuation, just to protect you from yourself, in steady state, when you get to your terminal value, I make your growth rate equal to your risk-free rate. That's a that's the safest assumption you can make in terminal value. But let's say you feel it's unrealistic for your company, either because you believe your company will grow faster than the risk-free rate. That's a little dangerous, but you know, you think it'll grow half a percent, maybe 0.2, but don't get carried away and make it 5% faster, maybe 0.5%. 
you can say you can override this assumption and enter that number. Alternatively, you can think of your company as a shrinking business, maybe an oil company, and override the growth rate with a much lower number than the risk-free rate. You can even enter a negative number if you think your company is going to start shrinking after the 10th year. The final question is actually very specific to U.S. companies. A lot of U.S. companies have cash that they've ended up, you know, that they've got trapped overseas. You think, what does that mean? If you make money overseas, you know, if you're, you know outside the U.S., you don't get taxed on that money until it comes back to the U.S. So often U.S. companies like Apple have, you know, Apple alone has $220 billion trapped outside the U.S. Now that's part of your cash balance, but it's not quite, right? Because you can't just take it out of the company without paying a penalty. So what I do is allow you here to tell me how much that penalty will be. You might view this sanguinely and say there's no penalty, the tax law will change, then you can bring the money back, in which case just put in, you know, just say no and leave, leave it at the default. But if you want to attach a penalty, tell me how much trap cash you have and what the, the extra tax you will have to pay when that money comes back. Because what you will have to pay is the difference between the U.S. tax rate and what you've already paid overseas. So the U.S. tax rate is 30% and the overseas tax rate is 20 You'll have to pay only an extra 10%. So you enter that, you basically have all the inputs. Now here's how you read the output. Basically, the, the at the top of the spreadsheet, you see me first start off with revenues. And if you have leases uh, and R&D, which I never mentioned, but if you have a company with R&D, you know, I actually allow you to capitalize R&D by saying yes. If you have no idea what that even means, just leave it at no. It's safer. But at some point in time, especially with technology and pharmaceutical companies, you might start to think about the inconsistency of treating R&D as an operating expense. But whatever you do, I will clean up for it. So what you will see here are the revenues and the corrected operating income, corrected for leases and R&D, projected over time. What's happening? The revenues obviously grow at the growth rates that were input, 3% for the next five years, scaling down to your terminal growth rate. The margins started what they are, 25.8%, and because the target margin was set lower, they drift down over time. So this is why you can use a spreadsheet for a money-losing company. You can have a negative margin up front, and as the margins improve towards a positive margin, your losses will become profits. So I'll get the operating income. I check to see whether you have to pay taxes. Check what? If you have NOLs, I'll check to see whether those NOLs will cover your, your profit. So I build in your NOLs into your cash flows through the tax rate. Your tax rate starts at the effective tax rate, and in the default, it moves towards your marginal tax rate. Now let me talk a little bit about reinvestment here. Now usually when you think about reinvestment, it includes capex minus depreciation plus change in working capital. What I've done is consolidated that entire amount into reinvestment. And I estimate it using a very simplistic tool. That sales to capital ratio 1.20 that I entered for Severstall, here's how I use it. I take the change in revenue from, your, from the base year to the first year and divide by 1.2. So in this case, my revenue goes up 3%. I take whatever that change in revenue is, which is about 100 and 180 million, divide by 1.2, I come up with a reinvestment of 140, 48 million. I put that into year one. So that's your consolidated reinvestment. It's plus depreciation, minus CapEx, minus change in working capital. And I do that for every year. You can also now see again why this will now work for a young growth money losing company because I can still estimate reinvestment based on how quickly your revenues are growing. I come up with my free cash flow of the firm and that number can be a big negative number if you have a growing firm with a lot of, lot of reinvestment. Those free cash flows of the firm get discounted back to today. At what rate? I start at today's cost of capital. And because it cost of capital changes over time, I keep track of the accumulated number. What does that mean? If my cost of capital is 9.32% in year one and 9% in year two, that's not the case here, I will discount back at 9.32% for one year and 9% in the second year. So as your cost of capital changes over time, you can see your discount factor has reflected. That's why you can't use the present value function in Excel. I compute the present value. One big loose end, remember that after year 10, your company's in steady state. I take the cash flow in year 10, which I compute by taking the after-tax operating income that year, and the assumption about return on capital. That return on capital allows me to compute a reinvestment. I come up with a cash flow and a terminal value. That terminal value has to get discounted back to today using that discount factor for year 10. You get a present value of the terminal value, the present value of the cash flows. You add them up. You get the value of the business as a going concern. 
Now, remember, I gave you a chance to tell me whether there was a likelihood your company would make it if you said yes to that and entered a probability. I will bring in that probability of failure and what your company would be worth if it fails and come up with an expected value across a going concern and failure. That gives me the value of the operating assets. I add cash. But when I add the cash, I subtract out whatever taxes you might have on the trap cash. I subtract out debt. I subtract out minority interest. And I add the value of the non-operating assets. Now you see why it would be nice if those non-operating assets and minority interest were in market value terms. I come up with the value of equity. I'm not quite done because if you have options, I will value the options as options. There's actually an option value spreadsheet built in here which uses your options to build in. I subtract other value of the options. I get a value of the equity in the common stock. I divide by the number of shares. I get a value per share. I compare to the price and tell you what the price is as a percentage value. Now you're done. But if you really want to complete this process, I would suggest you go to the next worksheet which says stories to numbers. You're saying, what does this do? Basically, it allows you to take the story you just told about a company, in my case, the Severstall story, and connect it to individual inputs. So if you take the revenue growth rate, I tell you why. I think Severstall, now that it's shrunk, is going to return to low growth. When you see my margin stay high but drop over time, I'll tell you why. Because I think Severstall is going to stay focused on its Russian operations. They're very profitable, but over time, competition is going to come in. I tell you why I moved to a 20% tax rate. I also tell you why the reinvestment is so low, because they have low growth. I tell you why the cost of capital is as high as it is. And essentially, I connect every part of my story to my inputs. I've, some, I've taken the output from the previous page and present in a way that's actually easier to see. So you can see the cash flows and the value. And this is just a summary of the valuation from above, but it allows you to connect your story to your numbers and check your own story. So that's pretty much it. Take a look at the valuation. And in fact, when I was done with this, I, 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 I took my valuation. And this is something I find useful for myself. So do it only if you feel the urge to do this. I took my valuation of Severstall and I made it into a picture. So basically, this is just the picture you saw just thrown up there. So when I try to present the valuation, you will see all the numbers you saw in my previous spreadsheet kind of work or, you know, work into the spreadsheet. So you'll see the cost of capital being built up, the cash flows building up over time, and what you saw in my valuation. is my So based on my story, the value that I'm getting for Severstall is about $15 per share. The stock was trading at $13.84. In fact, it dropped to about 12 something after I did the valuation, and I did buy the shares. I might live to regret this, but it looked, this company, strikes me as a company that's unusual, a company in a bad business that realizes it's in a bad business. That's not a denial. That's about it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry this, the, this, this webcast went as long as it did, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how to use that spreadsheet to convert a story into a valuation. Thank you very much for listening.